Florida. Good morning. We certainly enjoyed the sermon this morning. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good luck to you. Post office in the town of Camden, South Carolina, population 7,000 or thereabouts, opens at 8 o'clock in the morning. Ned Jarrett picks up his mail early. He can't wait for the rural free delivery. The walk from the post office to the bank gives Ned a chance to start planning his day, and it's a long one. It also gives him a chance to stop and socialize a bit, maybe talk a little politics or sports. It's a nice feeling to live and work in a friendly town like Camden. On a day like this, he's already read the morning paper, had breakfast, and helped his wife get the kids off to school. When he's home, of course. His business takes him away a good deal. Ned is general manager of Bowani Incorporated. His problems are the problems of any businessman. Labor, costs, financing. Often the last stop before going to his office is his accountant. Although his problems are the usual ones, Ned Jarrett is in a somewhat unusual business. At least, some people think so. Ned Jarrett's business is stock car racing. This quiet man is also one of racing's quickest. famous number 11 can be seen ripping by at NASCAR tracks from California to New York to Florida 10 months of the year. The National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing sanctions about 60 Grand National races for late model stock cars between January and November. Ned Jarrett runs in every one. He started racing seriously when he was 22. By 1960, at the age of 27, he had won NASCAR's Sportsman's Division Championship two years in a row. He felt he was ready, borrowed money to keep going, and moved up to the Grand National Circuit. He won five races that year. It was quite a beginning in the big leagues. In his second year on the Grand National Circuit, 1961, he won the National Championship. It wasn't easy. It takes a world of experience to become a good race driver. Like all great performers, he did it again. One of only five men to repeat the triumph. Ned won the national championship again in 1965, plus nearly $80,000 in prize money. His crew shares everything with Ned right down the line, and so does his family. He takes him with him wherever he can, and why not into Victory Lane? He's been in the winner's circle 50 times in six years on the Grand National Circuit and he has finished in the top five nearly 80% of the time. Ned Jarrett is champion of all the tracks, large, small, dirt, and asphalt. He's NASCAR's winningest driver. The road to a third championship starts early in the morning in Camden. The nature of Ned's business being what it is, he doesn't have his office right in town. If he did, Folks would be dropping in all day long to chew the fat about one thing or another, and he'd never get any work done. Instead, both office and garage are located on his car owner's plantation, about 10 miles outside of Camden. The rural sounds of South Carolina farming country are a far cry from the packed grandstands and cheering crowds. Bondi Long owns Ned's racing cars, and Bondi supervises the pit crew, the same crew that prepares the race cars. Ned Jarrett, Bondi Long, and their six-man crew are a team. Every day they're not racing, they're working on the car, maintaining it, preparing it for the next race. There's not only the thrill of driving, but also the thrill of building and setting up a piece of machinery so that it outperforms someone else's. It's a full-time, overtime job, 12 months of the year. 
being a champion has its rewards and demands. In any given day, men may be called upon to negotiate with promoters for upcoming races, doing advanced publicity work, lining up tests of equipment with manufacturers, booking track time, selling off old equipment they've accumulated, checking over all the bills and okaying them for payment, making travel arrangements for himself and the crew, and just running a business. The bright spot in the daily routine is the fan mail. Ned finds time to read and answer every one. Ned likes people, and they like him. In a schedule that keeps him on the go, on and off the track, he still finds time to speak to more than 50 groups a year about highway safety. Thank you, Mr. Wilson, and thank you, gentlemen. It certainly is a pleasure for me to be here today and to be associated with this fine group again. I had the privilege and the pleasure yesterday to speak to the university about the same thing that I'm going to talk about today. We had some 2,100 college students that we presented this program to. Now, you may think it's strange that a professional race driver is standing here talking to you about safety on the road. I can tell you that I feel safer on the racetrack than I do on the highway. Ned, I think it'd be interesting to this group to understand what attracted you to racing and what attracts any man to racing initially. Well, I started racing because I've always had a love for automobiles. I've always liked to drive anything I could get my hands on. I've always liked competition of all types. Competition? Yes. In the fastest growing sport in the country, America is a nation on wheels. Upwards of 45 million people now go to automobile races every year, and everyone drives to the track in a car. These are motorists, here to cheer their favorite cars and drivers. Auto racing has become the second largest paid attendance sport in the country. Where else would an ambitious young man from the Carolinas go who has a love for automobiles and a desire for competition? The NASCAR circuit is the biggest, the richest, the fastest. Together, the NASCAR circuit in the South and Southwest and the USAC circuit in the North and Midwest have total prize money of over $10 million. But you have to be there at the finish to win. After 12 years, Ned knows how hard he can run his equipment and stay in contention. Attrition is the enemy, and the track lies in wait for the slightest error. A winning driver like Ned knows how far to put his foot down on the accelerator without breaking the wheels loose. Barreling along in heavy traffic at 275 feet per second, 170 miles an hour, if the back end comes around or a driver corrects a bit too much going into a turn, he's had it for the day. A spectacular accident, but not one single driver was injured. Ned, you were drafting, following another car real close. Which driver has the most control over his car in a situation like that? Well, of course, drafting tends to pick the speeds of both cars up when we're on a high-speed racetrack. It affects the handling qualities of both cars. The front car actually feels more stable than the rear car, uh, but the rear car can cause movements by the front car by maneuvering in the turns. Of course, now, when we get in our own private cars and start home from the racetrack, well, the situation is completely changed because we don't know the abilities and limitations of the other drivers, so we have to drive more defensively on the highway than we do on the racetrack. Ned, what's the difference between the small dirt tracks that you race on and the big new super speedways that you have today? Well, very definitely, when you're driving on a short track as compared to a large track. You would more or less let it hang out a little more. You could afford to drive a little more reckless because you aren't going as fast. 
Now, I guess you would consider myself one of the hardest chargers on a dirt track. Normally our dirt races are only about 100 to 150 miles in length. Most of the dirt tracks are half a mile in length. But there again, it's a tremendous punishment on the equipment because most of these tracks tend to come apart or holes get in them and you have to just literally bounce the cars through the holes and slide them through the turns. It's not as easily to pass another driver on a dirt track as it is on a paved track, so I feel like it's important to get out front and try to maintain that position as long as you can. Racing is Ned's business, but as a professional, he knows himself, the road, and the equipment. It's just as true on the highway. You can't win if you don't get there. This is an experience he likes to share with his friends. Conscientious effort towards trying to be a better and a safer driver. Thank you. More questions. This time, a professional one. Ned, uh, do you know how much tilt we had in the car last time? Oh, I believe we had about two inches, John. Let's check the records here. How does he want the car set up for the next race? Ned Jarrett's an expert at beating the track. But you've got to beat the competition, too. Men like Daryl Derringer, a sure, fast hand. Junior Johnson, always the pace setter, the hardest charger of them all. Fred Lorenzen, with mechanic Jack Sullivan, is always the man to beat. Richard Petty, famous son of a famous father, likes to run in front. Marvin Panch, steady and consistent from start to finish. Tiny Lund, in first class equipment, can go all the way. A.J. Foyt, has a great finishing kick. In fact, any man on a given day can go all the way. To beat the best, you've got to outthink them, as well as outdrive them. To the side. I think we should set it up about the same way we had it before because the car was going real well. So. Ned Jarrett puts it all down in writing. He doesn't guess. He has a complete set of specifications for every setting on the car and for every track. Shock absorbers, I think we should run the same numbers. In fact, you should just take this uh, sheet and just set the car up exactly like we had it set up the last time. Same thing. Mm -hmm. By the way, are you going to call home and lose today? Oh, yes, that's right. I forgot about that back glass. We need that thing real bad. Yeah, we need it. It's holding everything up. Okay, fine. I'll call them right now. Okay. Operator, I'd like area code 704, please. 399. When his crew sets up the car, they know precisely what he wants, and they give it to him. Every driver works with his crew in setting up a car so that it reacts the way he wants it to. Ned likes that extra security in the turn so that he's in control of the car, not the other way around. Well, how did the tilt work out? Did you get enough weight in this time? I think so. It worked out pretty good. That's good, then. Let's go ahead and record these measurements. How about the right front? How much? Right front's 32. And Ned's cars are specially built and set up for racing by Holman and Moody, according to the rules and specifications of NASCAR. Holman and Moody prepare cars for other top four drivers. Within these strict limits, the car is then custom tailored to the driver by his own crew so that it becomes virtually an extension of his body. Have you loaded it yet? No, but uh, I'm planning on loading one eighth of an inch. That should be good, favorite right side. Right side. Yeah. Well, I think you just take the swap out of the thing because this big bar, you know, it's real sensitive and we can't afford to run too much wedge in. I'm afraid it'll throw the whole chassis out of focus. So this looks real good. I think we can go with it this way. And Give her a run. I feel like that'll do it. Okay, good. Once you've done everything you can to the car in the garage, the only way to find out what you've really got is to go race. This is it. Heavy, high-speed traffic. The toughest competition in the world, straining car and driver to their limits. 
racing is a tough business. It demands tremendous concentration, physical stamina, top equipment, and know-how. Most drivers get to the top, if they do, the hard way, through a series of wrecks and heartbreaks, until they get to the point where they can handle a stock car. Because Ned Jarrett came up the hard way, he leaves nothing to chance where safety is concerned. A steel cage protects him from broadside crashes. The bars actually push the other cars away. Heavy duty shoulder harness and seat belts keep him in his seat no matter what happens. A special headrest stops his head from snapping back. In case of fire, a driver's biggest hazard, a fire extinguisher mounted in the car, sprays Purple K in, around, and under it at a flick of a switch. The frame itself is completely reinforced with steel roll bars. The driver is encaged in steel. Another safety device is a peephole, which the driver uses to check tire wear on the crucial right front tire, which takes all the thrust of the high bank turns. Jarrett's crew will complete the final assembly in one minute in this speeded up version that you're about to see. Actually, they can do it in 10. is a supreme team effort. Victory, that is sometimes measured in split seconds, can be won or lost in the pits. The same crew that fights the clock in the garage gives Ned Jarrett four new tires, 22 gallons of fuel, a drink of water if he wants one, and a clean windshield, all in 30 seconds. They do this as many as five times in a race and over a hundred times in a season. In a 60 race season, Ned Jarrett burns up four to 500 tires, 120 wheels, 100 sets of spark plugs, 50 engines, 40 ball joints, 60 coil springs, 40 distributors, 40 sets of brake shoes, 30 sets of brake drums, 25 fuel pumps, 15 transmissions. Ned Jarrett's truck carries enough equipment to completely rebuild the race car minus the sheet metal. Racing is the toughest proving ground in the world. Three and a half hours on a speedway is equal to 100,000 miles on a highway. A race driver's life and livelihood depend upon his equipment. He needs the best of everything and lots of it. An average day for Ned Jarrett starts in the quiet town of Camden around 8 in the morning. It ends after a long and crowded day on a quiet, tree-lined suburban street. How does a man like Ned Jarrett balance all the elements of his life, his business, his racing, his speaking activities, and his family? Well, I have three children. Uh, my oldest son, Glenn, is 15. I have a son, Dale, who is nine, and a little girl, Patty, who is six. And of course, they're all avid Ned Jarrett racing fans. They attend as many of the races as possible when school will permit. And uh, even on weekends, uh, during school months, they go to quite a few of the races. 
Now, my little girl, she likes the glory. She's always getting around to getting her picture made after I have won a race. Now, my oldest son, Glenn, he really does not have a desire to become a race driver. He is a good athlete, but Dale, he seems destined to become a race driver. Hi, Dale. Hi. How'd you go today? Fine. Make good grades in school? Yes, sir. My wife was a race fan before we met, but she would a little rather that I do something else that I like as well that I could make as much money at. Hi, sweetheart. Hello. Tell them to eat. What kept you so long? Oh, just the usual things. I had to call with Charlotte, line up the rear window for the race car, and just throw one thing to another. Hey, what you making there? I'm making a black walnut cake. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Well, it won't be too long to suffer. Okay. Dale, did Patty and you wash your hands? Yes, sir. Did you get them good and clean? Yes, sir. Let me see. You didn't call me hair very well, though, did you? There are times when you have to make a decision as to whether you want to risk your life to maybe win a race. Well, I would have to have my family in mind when I would uh, think about something like this. But I think definitely that most race drivers would put their life before winning a race. Do you return thanks, please? God is great. God is good. Let us thank you for our food. By his hands we will all be fed. The two words that best describe Ned Jarrett are dedication and devotion. He is devoted to his family, dedicated to the sport of stock car racing, and to the business of racing. He has a job to do, and he does it well. He is racing's goodwill ambassador. They call him the quickest, quiet one.